today. Scripture is a covenant renewal ceremony, and it's all about what a great thing it is to worship God. It's no trifling matter. And that's what we're here to do. That's what you're preparing yourself for. And so as the sermon progresses, we'll get into more of exactly what that means. But for now, we're going to take a little time to take some deep breaths, to pray and reflect and get ready to do just that, to worship the Lord. A reading from the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and some of the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Now, therefore revere the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served, beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites, who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm, and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and made statues and ordinance for Shechem. 
Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak in the sanctuary of the Lord. The word of the God. Thanks be to God. Can you even imagine something like today's scripture ever happening again? It'd be like me finishing the sermon, and then before I could call out the hymn, you stood up. <laughs> and before I could ask just what in Sam Hill you thought you were doing, you said, you know what, pastor, I thought about it, you're right. You're right, it's high time I got off the fence and finally started acting like that Christian you've been saying I should all along. But then after you did that, instead of congratulating you, I rebuffed you. <laughs> I told you that you couldn't do it. I told you that you don't have it in you to follow the Lord. Can you imagine something like that happening? I can't. <laughs> if after the sermon, you stood up and said, you're right, Pastor. You convinced me. I'm committing myself to the Lord. Why, if that happened, I'd just probably turn into a column of vapor and float away. <laughs> I'd call our presiding bishop and tell her that I was the very first pastor in the history of the whole ELCA to, to complete the job description. I'd retire. I'd publish a book, 12,758 Easy Steps to Pastoral Perfection and How You Can Too. Not Joshua, though. Joshua is not the least impressed by the show of piety in today's scripture. In fact, Joshua tells the people that they're fooling themselves. He plainly tells them that they can't follow the Lord. He tells them that it's not possible for them. That it's not possible. And then, if all that wasn't enough, if all that wasn't enough, Joshua tells the people to think twice tells them to think twice. Joshua tells the people not to pick up their cross and follow Christ lightly. He tells them, in effect, that they're playing with fire and they ought to be careful. Can you imagine that? After all, we all know the pastor's job is to try and convince you that you can do it, that following Jesus is possible. <laughs> and then, should you decide to give it a go, my job is to encourage you along the way, not put you off. Not Joshua, though. Not Joshua. He doesn't mollycoddle the congregation. He shoots everyone straight. Apparently, there are larger concerns than everyone's ego, at least as far as Joshua is concerned. And I can't help but wonder if maybe Joshua isn't the better man of the cloth after all. Sure, his style might be a little coarse for our tastes. But you know what? At least the congregation wouldn't feel mollycoddled when they invariably hit the bricks. When the Virgin Mary was told that God was growing in her belly, she asked, how could this be? After all, she didn't get that adjective virgin tacked onto her name for nothing. In reply, the angel Gabriel just chuckled, not the least worried by that. And then almost laconically, he added, for nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible with God. I read somewhere that the seventh and eighth installments of the Mission Impossible franchise are in development. In fact, the seventh is scheduled to come out this spring. I wonder how it'll fare in the box office. I remember when the first Mission Impossible came out and that was a really big deal. Now though, not as much. And I don't think this is simply because Tom Cruise doesn't have the cultural cachet he once did. The reason I think is that you can only get away with calling the movies Mission Impossible so many times. You can try and get away with it, I suppose, maybe three times. But after the fourth installment, you've got to change the name of the franchise. <laughs> after all, 
Ethan Hunt's so-called impossible missions, he's already succeeded at them six times. Mission impossible? I don't think so. Mission difficult? Sure. Mission challenging? Why not? I'd even go along with mission improbable. A mission impossible? I don't think so. Not after he's successfully completed six so-called impossible missions. I'd suggest to you today, though, that it is not just the producers of the Mission Impossible movies who have misjudged possibility. Because this is a, calculation, a miscalculation you and I make. And it is one that we make regularly and with great frequency. You and I, we will be willing to admit our lives are difficult, but we certainly wouldn't say they're impossible, at least not most of our lives. And we certainly wouldn't say this is the case when it comes to uh, discipleship. We will admit following Jesus is hard, but we would certainly never say it's impossible. Loving that neighbor down the street who always leaves their trash out, it might be difficult, but we wouldn't say it's impossible. Or remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy, we, we would say, sure, it can be challenging at times, but we wouldn't say it's impossible and not bearing false witness against that coworker who takes every opportunity to enhance their own reputation, even when it comes at the expense of someone else, sure we'll concede it's unpleasant, but we wouldn't say it's impossible. It's my contention though, and this is based on personal experience, it's my contention that such matters are actually impossible, at least for mortals like you and me. It's one thing to be nice for a while. <laughs> and it's one thing to white knuckle a, a little piety once a week, most of the time. And, and it's, it's, it's something to refrain from gossiping. But you know what? That is another matter entirely from actually loving your neighbor. It's another matter entirely from really wanting to go to worship. <laughs> it's something else completely different from really seeing everyone else's actions in the best possible light, not just because you're making yourself, but because that's how you really see things. And that difference is the difference between possible and impossible. One day a rich ruler came to Jesus asking what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. After a brief tete-a-tete, Jesus told the man all he needed to do was liquidate every single one of his assets and give all the proceeds to the poor. As this usual high achiever walked away defeated, Jesus mused aloud that it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for the bourgeoisie to enter the kingdom of heaven. Dumbfounded, the disciples asked just who then has half a chance in you know where of getting to heaven. In reply, Jesus quipped, what's impossible for mortals is possible for God. What's impossible for mortals is possible for God. In my office, there are two Caravaggio prints. Caravaggio is a Baroque painter, one of the masters. And the one painting that's easiest to see is the one that's on the outside of my door. It's the calling of St. Matthew. And that painting is there as a wink and a nod to all you who'd say I'm a solid C minus pastor. But it's the other print that I want to talk about. That one hangs uh, in my office above my desk. And it's there for a reason. That painting is called the Entombment of Christ. And as you might have guessed, it depicts Jesus' burial. As was Caravaggio's style, the painting is full of action and emotion. One of the women in the back wails with her hands raised to God. Two other women look on sorrowful but ultimately helpless. And two men clearly struggle to try and place Jesus' limp corpse into the tomb with a shred of dignity. 
there's more going on in Caravaggio's painting than, a, uh, than his usual compelling uh, depiction of a moment bursting with action. It's the details that disclose some rather cogent proclamation. For instance, one of the men in his effort to, to hold Jesus' body has accidentally stuck his finger into the wound in Jesus' side. But it's Jesus' body that really holds the clue to unlocking Caravaggio's lovely little visual sermon and a delightful flourish of theological sophistication. Caravaggio has depicted Jesus' lifeless right hand falling across the tomb and not accidentally, he's painted Jesus' hand wide open, wide open. This painting is really an altarpiece, you see, and Caravaggio has depicted it so that the slab of Jesus' tomb appears to be breaking past the canvas. Instead of drawing it flush with the canvas, he's drawn it like it's coming out of the canvas, coming out of the canvas right into the worshiping community. It's as if Caravaggio is saying to the congregation that it is in your death that Jesus powerfully reaches into your tomb to draw you to him. In the final days of his life, some Pharisees came to Jesus and told him that he better get out of Dodge if he wanted to save his neck. In response, Jesus just stiffened his spine. He, he told those Pharisees that I must be on my way. He said he must be on his way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. And then shortly thereafter, Jesus did the impossible. Jesus did the impossible. Upon his cross, Jesus took all our possibilities and our impossibilities alike and died by them all. And then when he was uh, laid in the tomb, he buried all that there in his tomb once and for all. And he would, when he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, he refused to have any truck with all that old business ever again. Jesus has not come to to leave you to that tiresome old trade of willpower and results. No, he's come to do away with all that. He's come to do the impossible. Jesus hasn't come to get you on the program. He's come to do his program of impossibility, death and life in that order, not life and death, but death and life in that order. Jesus has come to do that impossible thing on you and on me too. Christ has come to give you a new life, his. And he's come to give you a new will too, his. And he's even come to give you a new future. His. And all this is found right at ground zero of all our impossibility, which is death. By his death, Jesus has cracked impossible wide open. Maybe you're hearing this sermon today and you're ready to take your stand with the Israelites. Or maybe after a week of setbacks, you're having second thoughts about that stand you took a while ago. Or maybe you just barely dragged yourself here. And all that thought of taking a stand, it sounds perfectly impossible. Wherever you're sitting on the matter, though, it's my job, like Joshua, to tell you that you can't do it. It's impossible. I know that might sound like a blow to your self-esteem. But really, it's the best news you've heard all week. And really, it's the best chance you have at loving yourself. And ultimately, it's the only chance you have of standing with the risen Lord on that great last day. Christianity is not, it is not a bold decision for Christ. Christianity is Christ's bold decision for you. And the only choice you have in the matter is where you park your corpse. You can prop it under the banner of, of your powers and capabilities. And if, you should do, and if you should choose to do so, you should know it won't go well. For one thing, our capabilities are not all they're cracked up to be. And for another, Joshua wasn't lying. The Lord is not about to go easy on you, at least not that old Adam or Eve in you. No, that old creature has one fate, the grave, the grave. And if you won't put that beast out of its misery yourself, the Lord will come and do it for you. The Lord will come and do it to you and me too. When your whims inevitably fall short and you turn from the Lord, the Lord will turn on you. The Lord will turn on you, but not out of anger. No, the Lord will do this out of great mercy. 
God loves you too much to leave you to your own folly and to leave me to my own folly. Instead, what will happen is Christ, God will come after you in the form of Christ, Christ that good shepherd, Christ that good shepherd and even better assassin. He will come after you and will do you in. But once everything you've got has been consumed, you will finally be ready to consume the Lord. You will finally really partake of communion. And it's in that, because it's in Christ's body and his blood where your strength is found and your salvation too. In Christ, not yourself is, is your only chance at following the Lord. And by his perfect obedience, this chance is really no chance at all. It is an accomplished fact. Jesus was not lying when he said, it is finished from the cross. In, cross, in Jesus' cross, he did the impossible. And in his cross is found the bridge between our possibilities and, impossibility, and God's impossibility completed. In Christ is your discipleship, and in him is your perfect obedience too. When the women returned from the tomb that first Easter, coining the glad tiding, he is risen. The disciples thought it was a bunch of idle chatter. So irrevocable did Jesus' death seem. Later that day, later that day though, just as easy as pie, Jesus showed up in their midst. <laughs> Jesus walked through the walls to show up to them. And before that, he walked through death. And really what he was walking through was impossibility. Jesus didn't talk about impossible that first Easter. He did it. And he came to the disciples from the other side of it. And before anyone can ask that dead man just what he was doing, living and breathing, Jesus gave them his peace that passes all understanding. One last story, and this one comes from Labor Day this year. As was anticipated, the, the attendance was a little light that Sunday. And as such, the service was low-key. The sermon uh, was simple and straightforward, and I didn't ask anyone to stand for the hymns. However, when it came time for the hymn of the day, something unusual happened. Uh, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed someone standing anyway. Not wanting to, to make this person feel self-conscious, I tried not to jerk my head to, to look to see who it was. And as I tried to figure out who it was that was standing from the, my peripheral vision, I noticed something odd. I noticed that this person was just a little too tall. And I noticed that they were dressed all in white, almost dazzlingly so. Before I could reckon with how strange these details were, it dawned on me. <laughs> that standing member was really no member at all, or rather, it was the member. It was Jesus Christ himself. Contrary to all appearances, it wasn't just us worshiping that Sunday. And, and it wasn't a distant, abstract deity we were worshiping either. No, we were worshiping the risen Lord. And what's more, there was nowhere else that Alpha and Omega himself would have rather have been in all eternity than right there with us in our humble little gathering. As I tried to pull myself together, it was as if I could hear Jesus Christ himself saying, everything that's got you thinking this is impossible, it's just perfect for me. As I tried to pick up, as I tried to pick myself up from off the floor, the hymn ended. It was time to confess the Apostles' Creed. And as I took my place at the table, I never felt so superfluous before in my entire life.
And so now, be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And indeed, let us do just that. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice by the power of the Holy Spirit with our hymn. receive your blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Yes, Amen. And now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us conclude our service by praying as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so before we conclude, as far as uh, announcements, you can check out our website at the very end of this service. It'll have our website. You can go there and, and find out the regular comings and goings of, of what, the Holy Spirit to, what the Holy Spirit is up to in our midst. You can join us for worship. If you feel so comfortable and called, we pray you do. Uh, we worship here at Faith Lutheran on Sunnyside on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. And then uh, you could also just give us a call. <laughs> you can find the phone number on our website. You could send us an email or a Facebook message, and you can also check out our Facebook webpage, and that has links to the services and um, some of the comings and goings on. But we've got uh, Stephen Ministries going now. We've got uh, confirmation in Sunday school and Bible study. Um, Social Concerns is doing a crop walk. Plenty of other things as I look in my notes. And um, we, we'd love for you to uh, mix it up with us in the Holy Spirit. So, all right then. Well now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>